Assalamualaikum viewers, uh, this is Farooq Ahmed. Uh, I'll be hosting your show, Careers 360 Business, Business Insight today. Those of you who are joining us for the first time, Careers 360 Business Insight is an effort of Careers 360 to help its member to understand the dynamics of the market and employment trends. And also on top of that, what we really try to do is provide you with the concrete steps in terms of how you can progress further in your career and professional journey. And uh, those of you who have been with us from the beginning, uh, you might have noticed that uh, we haven't done an episode for a while, but we have decided to resume today because uh, one, uh, we believe uh, this Career360 Business Insight adds a lot of value to our members in terms of helping them uh, in their professional and career growth. And also for the previous episodes, we had a wonderful feedback. So moving forward, you'll see the episodes coming, on, uh, coming out in much more regular basis. And uh, uh, you know, behind the scenes, we have been trying to work hard to make uh, the time you spent with us as valuable as possible. So we are working on a lot of changes. So I would uh, advise you to uh, keep watching and look out for those changes. Uh, the, uh, the, in terms of the format that uh, we follow, that uh, generally we have a, a very, uh, we have a guest speaker, which is a very eminent personality, somebody who is a leader in the industry and a very accomplished person, and we share their stories. And, um, you know, I must say these stories do not, um, uh, you don't find them very often. And there's a lot of hard work, a lot of discipline, a lot of uh, uh, perseverance uh, go uh, uh, to make those stories actually uh, realized. And, uh, and I think I would say on top of that also a philosophy that goes behind as well. So uh, uh, I, would, I would voice uh, my viewers uh, in terms of, you know, uh, listen to those stories very carefully and do try to replicate anything you find that is uh, useful and could help you uh, to further your career journey. Um, uh, so uh, in terms of uh, the topic that uh, we have decided today is, uh, which is the CEO mindset uh, in the recruitment process. So who else could be better uh, to talk about this is CEO himself. We have a very eminent personality today with us from UAE. He is a very accomplished person uh, and uh, he has uh, basically a business that is spanning over seven different cities uh, around the globe. Uh, he is founder and CEO of one of the leading advertisement company called Brand Beat. And he's also a founder of uh, asset and investment management company. And uh, he also heading one of the technologies companies as well called TechRoss. So without a further ado, let me welcome our guest today, Mr. Shafat Hashmi Saab. Shafat Saab, Assalamu alaikum ji. How are you? Wa alaikum salam, Farooq. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me at the Careers 360 and uh, the Business Insight Show. Uh, such an honor and a privilege to be connected with you and especially your audience. That sounds good. Yeah, I, I would also like to say thank you very much for taking time to, you know, uh, join us on this show today. And I'm sure just like myself, uh, our viewers are also very excited to find out uh, more about your uh, journey and also insight into uh, basically, uh, you know, in terms of how the recruitment process works. So first of all, let me uh, ask you this quick question. You know, a lot of people would like to know that how this all started and um, how, you know, in terms of uh, uh, how your journey progressed and uh, how did you get to this point where a lot of people look up to, to you today and, uh, you know, see you as a source of inspiration. I think the journey uh, is something which we start at a very early age. You know, I started working when I was at the age of 14 um, with my father alongside. So I could see him doing trading and, you know, he was into import and export of fine nuts to the Saudi market. And right. I still remember that we had to sell, you know, those polished 
fine nuts. And uh, so therefore we would get regular fine nuts from the market, uh, the wholesale market, bring it home, have some of these women come down on a daily wages. They would sit, they would open them up and then they would, we would send it for polishing. We will grade them and then we will wrap them, pack them, create a container, send it out. This is where we started. And uh, when we talk about recruitment, my, my earliest experience of recruitment was essentially uh, started from here. And I saw that we had a, we had a Kari Saab, a Molvi Saab, who had to come and teach us Quran, uh, just like any other home. And my father would interview every other Kari who would come through. And I, I was trying to learn that what are those things through which he makes the decision that who's going to teach my kids? And uh, how do you create those teams and everything? So, you know, we, uh, we have been through that. And from there, uh, I was studying and I was working. I think it's that drive within you to be successful. Um, and when you have that drive, the most important part is that you should not have the ego. Mm -hmm. If there is ego and there is drive, you'll mess it up completely. So you have to be a learner. Even today at the leadership position, which looks like apparently that we are a business leader, uh, frankly, it's just one perspective of looking at it. The actual perspective is that I'm a servant of my customers and my clients. And this is exactly what I am. So my job is to serve them, is to fulfill their needs, is to make sure that they're not only satisfied, but they're excited and delighted with what we do and what we offer. And same is the expectations when we recruit someone or when you get recruited. Um, there is always a mix. People generally say it's good to start your entrepreneurial journey at an early age or the moment you've graduated, just go for a startup or go for doing your own business. Uh, my journey is so that I had a home-based business, which my father owned. I, I was regularly working when I was doing my graduation and my master's and I was actively involved in it. Because a lot of our students, what we do, especially in the developing countries like mm -hmm. Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, and many others, unlike Western countries, what happens in Western countries, the moment you hit the college, you're also working part-time and you're also, so you're earning and you're studying. Right. So they waste less time. Our problem is that until we are done with our master's uh, degree, we are still sitting on our parents' money. So what happens is that the syllabus is the same, but we waste our time uh, with friends, with hanging out, uh, with so many things that our youth does, you know. And the good idea is that you could do something freelance, you should look for a part-time job. And while you're studying from literally A-levels onwards until your master's, you should be working and studying at the same time. Sure. The moment you graduate, it's very important to do a job. I always recommend that you should do two jobs. One in an SME sector, because in an SME, what happens is that it's a small organization. You try to understand the business owner's mindset. You learn how he makes money. You learn how he is tight on cash flow and still somehow manages the cash flow. Furthermore, in a small business, that your business owner might rotate you multifunctional. And because it's a small setup, you would learn a lot of things, what my accountant is doing, what my marketing guy is doing, what my sales guy is doing. And there are a lot of chances for you to grow. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, you also have a platform to go and work really hard against the established brands in your industry and create that penetration and create your mark. The next step, what I always advise is that go to a corporation. When you do the next job at a corporation, even at a lesser salary bracket compared to what you were making in an SME, but you have a brand attached on your CV. And when you go in a good big multinational corporation, you learn that you're a small piece of puzzle in the bigger structure. Mm -hmm. You learn systems, you learn procedures. And most importantly, if you're in sales or somewhere, you create that network of people from within the sector and you get recognition after serving there for a couple of years. Sure. Now, if you wish to be an entrepreneur, 
then it's good to go in the similar industry with, in which you have done your job because you already have a pre-established network of suppliers, access to distributors and customers. And you could just join the whole string and create your entrepreneurial journey out of there. Uh, but again, there are no set rules. So it's, it's completely your choice. So, uh, I mean, I, I see, yeah, that's, that's very true. I mean, in terms of, you know, that uh, if you're working for a small organization, you get to do a lot and you learn a lot as well because your role is not uh, very specific and generally small business. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities to do, do a lot of things. Whereas when you join a large, the large organization, uh, they are, uh, have a lot of uh, system in place, a lot of procedures that you have to follow. So you to learn how to structure things. So I think very valuable advice. I would like to know, I mean, in terms of when would, do you think your entrepreneurial journey actually started? What was very the, young age, yeah. very, very young age. Mm -hmm. I, I started with my father. Uh, we, we had a, a printing press. We were into importing aluminum panels and um, you know laminated wooden floors. I was the first one to do that. Wow. I also put up uh, and established an academy with my teachers with whom I was studying A-levels. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where I started. So I did a lot of these little, little small businesses. Somehow they were grown over time. Uh, sometimes I would lose interest and I would sell them off and you know just take an exit. So uh, this is where it started, but essentially uh, during the 2008 recession, mm -hmm. when it hit us and I was in Dubai, uh, and I could see that every person who was on top of me and who was literally on the bottom of me in the hierarchy were fired. And I was the one hanging. So I was like, oh gosh, it's as risky as getting fired tomorrow. And you have your rentals to pay, you have your mortgage to pay, you have your car finance to pay. Um, so and you have to survive all by yourself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a typical expat story. And that's where I realized that it is imperative uh, for us to have uh, a secondary revenue stream, mm -hmm. which is very important. So I usually recommend people, uh, people do say that, oh, while you're doing a job, you shouldn't start your business. You should be laser focused on your business. No, while you're doing your job, you should start your business. You know, you should not leave the job. That's what I recommend. When you see that your business is somehow a little established or established enough to pay for your bills, mm -hmm. that is the time that you can make a switch. Because you might be doing a job, you might try three different businesses and three of them fail. But the worst idea is that you burn all your ships and become a fool and get into a business and two months down the lane, you're gone. So mm -hmm. until and unless you have some savings with you, which is six months of your operational expenses for your business is in your pocket, Mm -hmm. Okay, then you can leave your job, sure. get into the business. It's a wise decision. I think you're probably pretty spot on. I mean, in terms of for a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, generally the cash flow is the biggest challenge, you know. Uh, and many of the good ideas die just because they probably don't have enough runway uh, uh, to basically True. survive and sustain. So, I mean, um, I mean, in your opinion, do you think everybody should be an entrepreneur or is it just for, you know, uh, a certain type of people who should actually get, get into it? Interesting uh, question. I think if everybody becomes an entrepreneur, then who's going to do the job? <laughs> and, uh, you know, entrepreneurship is frankly is not for everyone. Entrepreneurship is very difficult. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. As much as we try to foster entrepreneurship at a, at a university level these days and with the startup ecosystem and so much more going on, uh, look, it requires a lot of persistence, patience, resilience. And you, it's not only about having one functional skill, but you require a lot of skills. And I think the most important skill is the people skill. Mm -hmm. That is extremely important because with people skill, you can do sales and you can also manage your team. Mm -hmm. And most of the entrepreneurs themselves sometimes are not super smart, but they are lucky to have a great team which works for them. 
So for any businesses to grow, we need to understand that it's not a one man army which wins the war. It has to be the entire army which needs to be trained and has to be in line with your business vision and your objectives to win the war. And therefore, it's, it's a lot about motivation, training, skill development, uh, conflict management, and then creating that balance between micromanagement and uh, general management, um, you know, uh, talking about customer satisfaction, leading by example, and there are so many things to it. You need, you need to be super action oriented. So an entrepreneur is someone, I always believe, okay, money is a driving force, mm -hmm. is a motivational force, but for modern entrepreneurs or those who have really made it on the top, it's not only the money, but there are certain other things associated with it as well. You know, uh, and if you try to focus on that and you have the bigger picture, you'll probably be more successful in a shorter time mm -hmm. uh, compared to someone who's just falling money. Because the one person who's greedy, you have a lot of chances to fall into a trap of a wrong deal, true. a too good to be true deal. Mm -hmm. And this is where a lot of entrepreneurs do make a mistake. They sign up a client and, you know, contracts, legal. So there are a lot of things. I think anybody can be an entrepreneur, but uh, it really depends whether you have the patience to be one. Right. I mean, definitely. I mean, like you mentioned, a uh, lot of people dream about having, you know, uh, uh, you know, creating a wealth uh, and probably money is the main driver. They think about, oh, if you become a successful person, you're going to have, you can have everything you wish for. But like, I mean, in terms of, do you think that what a real inspiration of an entrepreneur should be? And generally, who is the person, uh, I mean, in case of you, uh, what was your inspiration? Like what, what you were uh, motivated uh, for? I think uh, I have been a very charitable person all my life. Uh, I would love to give, I would love to support. And even while I was doing my job, it was very difficult for me to fire someone and break someone's heart. Uh, I always wanted to be, and I have been very professional in, in how I've operated, but I realized, you know, almost more than a decade and a half ago, that one of the best charities is to create employment. Mm -hmm. And it does not hurt someone's integrity while you help them and support them. And I think if somebody is, you know, the market median or the market average of a certain job is let's say $10,000. But if you're paying $12,000, consider it also as a great act of uh, retaining a good employee mm -hmm. and keeping him motivated, making sure he's super excited, working extra, putting in his best, continuous improvement. So I'm a believer that if you pay a little extra than the market median, Yes, people do think that you might not be able to compete and your cost may go up. But what my experience is that the benefits outweigh the cost. So, uh, you know, frankly speaking, this is all that would inspire me and there was nothing else. Uh, another thing which inspired me also was the saying of a holy prophet, peace be upon him, uh, that doing business is obviously better than doing a job. You know, so uh, that was one of the inspiration, not that I wanted to carry a business card which mentioned CEO or chairman. I mean, you, you carry a card of an unknown company which says CEO XYZ compared to director marketing, Nestle or Unilever or PNG, sure. you know, you can weigh the two. So while you're sitting there with an MNC on top at a very senior position and you do have the respect and reputation, if you even carry CEO or even chairman on your card, you might not have the reputation because the business is not established. True. So it's not about that. It's not about the business card. True. It's just about where you wish to be and what you want to do in life. So I realized I have a few years. I don't know how much I have, but whatever time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with, wanted to make the best out of it, the most out of it and wanted to add value and give back to the society. And one of the best ways to give back to the society is to create employment. Create employment. Right. 
So the motivation definitely should not, the money should not be the, the, the top priority. I mean, generally, uh, I would also, you know, I mean, in terms of uh, whenever somebody asks me for the advice and I say, you know, if you are passionate about what you are doing, money becomes a byproduct. So, yes. yeah, so, so in your case as well, you, 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 are, you were passionate about helping others and trying to create employment opportunities. Uh, this is wonderful. Uh, Shivaza, I would like to now come to our topic uh, for the discussion today, which is understanding the mindset of the CEO about the recruitment process. So uh, before I get into that, I'd just like uh, to get your thoughts in terms of how do you understand the, what is actually the recruitment processes and uh, you know, how, um, uh, what are the different steps and, or maybe, you know, like, you know, there are different level of uh, uh, positions with the organizations and there, there might be different uh, recruitment process for each different level. So how do you see uh, the recruitment process basically? Well, for our businesses, because we have an advertising firm and, and we have an asset management firm, essentially both of these firms are, uh, are services based. We are not into manufacturing and it's, it's a services industry. Now, so I could really shed light on services recruitment, to be honest. Um, uh, I'm not the manufacturing type. We have been in manufacturing at one point of time, but again, I was really heavily involved in recruitment over there. So for us, let's start with lead generation or attracting the pool of uh, prospects. Now, how do you attract the pool of prospects? You need to step back. We need to understand what is your company. And if you are a brand, you would attract a lot many people. But if you're not a brand and you're a small company and nobody has heard about it, then your artwork of how you advertise your position actually reflects a thousand words. You know, moreover, the portal on which you're advertising also speaks of a thousand words. The recruitment agencies through which you want to create uh, that leads of full generation also reflects how professional or what kind of people you're dealing with you know, or recruitment advisors or universities that you're dealing with. So how we really do it is that we try to create a very nice ad which really reflects our company values and our company culture. That is extremely important. And we also mentioned that what kind of clients, for example, we have served. And when a recruiter is applying, you need to remember his mindset as well. Uh, sorry, an, uh, a prospect. His mindset is he has looked at the job on a job portal. He doesn't care. He just wants to shoot his CV, press send, uh, copy paste a cover letter and go to the hop to the next job and to the third and to the fourth. What I always and what we see is that we, we do not really, it's not only the CV. CV is a pre-screening process. So <laughs> yes, the CVs come through and um, what we do is that we do not only have our HR screen the CVs, but we have the line managers screen the CVs as well. So when they screen the CVs, uh, because we work on key, uh, you know, key words or key skills that we are looking for, and we give weightage to each skill that, okay, we need 60% this, 30% this, 10% this, 20% this, and it's a mix of both character and skills together. So there are a lot of uh, soft skills, there are a lot of uh, personal attributes uh, which are there. So we are working currently on a 40-60 on a ratio when it comes to 60% skills and 40% personality. Uh, we are looking for people who have integrity, who are honest, who have a passion to work, self-driven, all these words are pretty much there. Most importantly, being in services industry, we're looking for people who are presentable, who are clean and, you know, uh, communication skills, because a lot of people have this assumption that, oh, I'm an engineer or I'm a technical guy, so I don't really have to have good communication skills. It's wrong because there is internal communication going on all the time. And if you have bad communication skills, even if you're technical, it becomes a mess up it creates confusion and it creates bottlenecks. So we look for those things, that's very important. So once our CVs are screened, then we host the first line of interviews, uh, which is usually done by our HR department. 
and uh, instead of this that HR does first and then the line managers do, I make sure the line managers sit next to the HR and just finish it off in one go. So it makes our process a little bit more efficient. 90% of the times, we, our third interview, which is usually with me directly, is done on the same day. Right. So we do not waste time that, uh, you know, because someone who's jobless, remember, he doesn't have money. Yeah. You don't know which city he's traveling to, how he has traveled. So what we do is that we invite them first and then we invite him the second time and then we invite him the third time just because as much as they are looking for a job, as much as we are seeking them, sure, sure. you know, so companies or business leaders having the mindset that somehow employees are here and the employer is here, it's the wrong mindset. Sure. It has to be empathy. And until and unless this person is not part of your system, you're both equal. And this is the right meaning of equal employment opportunity, not just black and white, boy and girl, and you know, all the rest of it or ethnicities. Mm -hmm. So when someone comes in, I usually take out time. If I'm away from the office, I'll go online and immediately spot on. Let's say we have 50 graphic designers who have been shortlisted. I spend two minutes with each, tick, 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 tick. and I say, okay, I recommend three of them, four of them. Leave it to the line manager, let him decide who they wish uh, is the best resource for us. And uh, I always look at people from many different perspectives. It's like a two-minute screening before we hire. Well, if there is a, a senior position, a managerial position, then obviously we go into an in-depth interview. For sure. And in that case, uh, if it's uh, somebody as a head of marketing or a head of sales or a head of investments or, or a managerial position with whom I'm going to trust my rest of the team members and colleagues or to whom who is going to present my brand outside to the external customers, those people are, is usually a lengthier process because I always dine out with them or I always have a coffee with them. I try to know them at a much closer personal level before bringing them into my home or my family. Sure. Sounds good. And uh, I'm sure like, you know, a lot of companies out there who uh, want to hire people and there are opportunities out there. Uh, but at the same time, they, they find it very hard to find the right person for, for a given position. And I'm sure, yourself also might have gone through so some of those challenges. What are some of the, like, you know, uh, those points of frustration you find when you think the candidate was almost there but could not make it because of those reasons? And, uh, and you find those, those things quite often, you know, is lacking. So maybe it could serve as a point of advice to our members to say, you know, you should uh, always make sure you have these things in place before you actually even start looking for a job. I think number one is you've written something on your CV mm -hmm. and it doesn't reflect. So first problem is when you lie on the CV mm -hmm. and the skill is not there with you. Number one, that's the first thing where you're screened out. The second thing is that you come in with a know all attitude that I know everything. I mean, as much as we don't know much and you cannot know much, so that becomes an issue. The third thing is not only underconfidence, but also overconfidence. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we let go of people who don't really fit in our culture. I mean, let's say in our firms, the culture is very open, very dependable, and it's a lot of interdependence and a lot of cross-cultural communication going on. Um, so we observe a lot of things. Uh, for example, when we, uh, when, we, when we hire people and they're, they're men and women who have come down to us and we've interviewed them and they, after a while they'll just start getting emotional mm -hmm. and they will have tears in their eyes. And, you know, they will, they will say something, oh, we have lost this. And at the moment they show tears, this means somehow, I mean, I do feel sympathetic to them, but not someone that we would hire, you know, based on that. Then the fourth thing is when your nonverbal communication, which is your clothes um, in men are either too flashy mm -hmm. 
or with women are way too uh, exposing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you want to come down showing that you have a certain sex appeal and you'll be able to land on the job because of that, that's the very moment that you're not the right person for us. Mm -hmm. It has to be dressed um, modestly in terms of... You have to dress neutral mm -hmm. and you have to dress very professionally. And I always recommend that the person who's looking for a job, his job is to look for a job. True. And if he hasn't taken the right tutorials to look for a job properly and to do the right interview and to come across proper, so if he has not put in the right hard work in, in, a, in an objective which is very personal to him, what on earth is he going to do with my company? True. You know? yeah. So to begin with, that is very important. You know? And then the fourth, fifth thing is that we usually ask questions which relate to personal integrity. Mm -hmm. and situations and we, we try to see how this person will respond to a certain situation now people have created a number of demos and typical questions you know for example you must have looked at sell me this pencil or a pen mm -hmm. uh, is this glass half full or half empty so you know these are all nonsense questions not something that i really buy into mm -hmm. what we really look at is that we go a little deeper and we talk about our own services we try to understand how clear he is when it comes to strategy mapping. Mm -hmm. I think the most important thing that we look at for people is common sense. Mm -hmm. We look for people who have common sense, common logic, mm -hmm. who can uh, you know, improvise as they go. Sure. And people who can improvise are only those who are flexible. So as much as we say and say, you gotta, I'm a quick learner, mm -hmm. you know, see, it's not an institution. You're coming here for a job. So don't tell me you're going to be a quick learner. I'm not going to teach you anything. I might train you and take you a level up, but I don't want quick learners. You know, go to a university to learn. Okay? And <clears throat> if, on the contrary, if the same person tells me that I'm a quick adapter and I can adopt very quickly to your culture and to your values, no, that makes a lot of sense. Okay? Um, I like people who tell me that, yes, I do have these skills, which I'm confident, and these, this is where I'm actually weak. Mm -hmm. Now, when a lot of interviewers, when they prepare their uh, people and prospects to in go for an interview, and typical question is, okay, what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses? Yep. So people tell you, oh, don't tell your weakness, you know, just, just deflect it somehow, sure. you know, and you could just present your weakness in a positive way as well. Yeah. Now, maybe it works in a lot of other companies where you have a typical HR sitting on top, but we are different, you know, as, as an agency, as a, as a company and as a group. Sure. When we talk, ask about your weakness, you've got to be dead straight. This is my weakness. Yeah. I'm yeah. disorganized. I'm ill-disciplined, for example. Sure. I have bad communication skills. We want to know your weakness. Don't allow us to explore your weakness over six months and then train you on it. Sure. If I know your weakness today, I know exactly what my HR has to do to train you in those areas and fill the gap. Mm -hmm. So do not waste my time and your time that we are trying to explore you, who you are, and we just can't get to know you because you've learned something to sure. cover up your weakness and still sort of go in. So that is not integrity. We mm -hmm. love people with integrity. We love people who are very open, communicative, Mm -hmm. And most importantly, I think uh, one has to be extremely decent mm -hmm. and should hold a very strong character. That's very important. I mean, we as a branding agency, when we create brands and packaging and brand guidelines, we define the personality and the character of a brand. Sure, sure. Right? And the people who are defining a character of a brand, if their own character is not strong, they cannot build a character of a brand. Of a brand. And especially for my sales team, uh, we do a rigorous uh, research because the salespeople are the first interaction who represent our firm. Mm -hmm. So my firm's logo is written on their forehead. Yep. <laughs> people know my firm because of my people. True. Right? So the person who picks up the phone 
and the tone in which he talks, the way he talks, what he talks, when he talks, all those things, every time he interacts with anybody outside, he represents our pride. So uh, we do a lot of focus on uh, our business development and sales guys. And for them, we definitely look for people who are smart, good looking and so on and so forth. Uh, definitely very valuable tips and advice for uh, our members. And uh, just to, to, to recap, uh, when uh, we are looking out for a job, we have to make sure that uh, uh, we are honest about our CV and uh, we have the right attitude and also uh, the right confidence. And on top of that, we also make sure that we are dressed properly for the occasion. Um, once again, Shafa Saab, uh, I must say that uh, all of us have really enjoyed uh, listening to your story and your journey. And uh, also, thank you very much for sharing very valuable tips uh, uh, with us. Um, and uh, to our viewers, uh, I would also like to say thank you for joining us today. And if you do like, uh, 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 you have enjoyed the show, uh, please do like us and share us on social media. Um, uh, Shifa Saab, thank you very much thank again. You. And inshallah, we touch base again soon. Thank you very much. Allah Hafiz. Uh -huh.